with a lot of the pleasures of the world. The real pleasure is not so much in the pleasure itself, but in the delight we take in it, anticipating how good it's going to be. Then after it's done, talking to ourselves about how great it was. This is our way of encouraging ourselves to look for it again. This delight, as the Buddha said, usually is one of the accompaniments of craving. It's what nourishes craving. And in most cases, craving is a bad thing. It leads to suffering. We delight in things that really don't have much true happiness to offer, true pleasure to offer. But it's all in the way we dress them up. Like that dog that visits us every now and then. The one that wears sunglasses and little outfits. A lot of the owner's pleasure is in the outfits and the sunglasses. And this, the Buddha said, is the reason why we fall for things that really don't give us much satisfaction. But we can learn how to delight in good things, too. After all, when you're getting started on the path, you need something to encourage you. Craving, desire are part of the, our motivation. We want to put an end to suffering. And so we need to learn how to feed that desire to keep it going. The Buddha lists six kinds of skillful delight. And they really are worth cultivating. He says that you, as you engage in these kinds of delight, you gain happiness in the here and now, simply anticipating how good it's going to be as you practice the path and as you reach the end of the path. And this delight also is what provides the source, the nourishment for staying on the path. The first is delight in the Dharma, the fact that there is a Dharma that teaches us that there is an end to suffering, and it can be attained through human effort. It explains how we suffer, why we suffer. It explains the big issues of life, aging, illness, death, separation. It gives reliable guidance in how to act, how to speak, how to think. It reassures us that the effort that's put into developing skillful actions is well spent. Basically lays things out. As the Buddha said, it's admirable in the beginning, admirable in the middle, admirable in the end. In other words, the words of the Dharma are inspiring. The practice is a noble practice. It's one in which we engage in developing the noble qualities of our own minds. And the end is total freedom from suffering of any kind, freedom from restrictions of any kind. It's a good dharma. So we can take delight in that. It's that conversation the Buddha had with the, with the Asura. He talked about how the Asuras take delight in the ocean. The ocean has many marvelous qualities. And they looked at the Dharma and the Vinaya of the Buddha and noticed it had many marvelous qualities as well. So when your practice begins to flag, remind yourself, you've got a good road map here, the most reliable one there is. It's been tested for over, over 2,000 years. And it deals with the big issues in life, issues that are not specific to any race or class or nation or culture. And that only presents the issues, but it solves them. It points the way to a happiness that is free from aging, free from illness, free from death.
So take delight in that. The next two types of delight are delighting in developing and delighting in abandoning. In other words, developing skillful qualities and abandoning unskillful ones. The Buddha recommends this from the very beginning of the path in his instructions to Rahula. He says you try to act on skillful intentions, and when you look at your actions and you see that they actually are harmless, you take delight in that. And that should be your energy to keep on practicing, to get better and better at the practice. And John Mahabua talks about taking delight in seeing little flakes of defilement getting peeled off the mind, just like flakes of bark getting peeled off a tree. In other words, in other words regard it as a victory each time you're able to say no to a desire that you know is unskillful, or say no to a mind state that's unskillful, to figure it out why you would go there. And see through it to the point where you realize you don't want to go there anymore. The next delight is delight in seclusion, enjoying being alone. It's interesting that the Pali Canon portrays Mahagasapa as being strict and stern. But he's got this wonderful poem where he talks about how great it is to be out in the wilderness. And this is back in the days when wilderness was not appreciated. When people wrote, poetry about the beauties of, of nature was domesticated nature. The first wilderness poetry that we have, or the oldest wilderness poetry we have, is in the Pali Canon. It talks about the delight that comes from just being out in the wilds where there's nobody around. And think about the, the story of the elephant. When it lived with its herd, it would go down to drink the water, and everybody else in the herd had gone down and been in the water and made it muddy. When they went down to bathe, the different elephants would knock into him. And so he decided to go off and live alone. Living alone, he had clean water. When he went to, down to bathe, there was nobody to knock into him. When he needed to scratch himself, he would take a branch and scratch himself. The Buddha makes a comparison to a meditator out alone in the forest. Look around, there's nobody to interfere with you, nobody to harass you, nobody to take up your time. And you get into jhana as your branch with which you scratch yourself, on which you can find a pleasure that is really gratifying, a pleasure that you can't get when you're embroiled with people. So appreciate that. Because seclusion, of course, here is not just physical seclusion, it's also mental seclusion. When the mind is secluded from unskillful states and can settle down with a sense of inner ease, uninterrupted, smooth, steady. Learn to appreciate that, learn to delight in that. The last two kinds of delight are delight in non-affliction and delight in non-objectification. Now these are two names for nirvana, or two aspects of nirvana, but they also describe ways in which you practice. As you practice, you're not afflicting anybody, observing the precepts, finding pleasure in getting the mind concentrated, using your discernment to get past your defilements. You're practicing non-affliction even as you're headed toward the ultimate state of non-affliction. The same with non-objectification. Objectification is when you start with the idea, I am the thinker, and from there you identify yourself as a being that needs to feed, that needs a certain part of the world to feed on, whether it's a physical part of the world or a part of the, the world of ideas. You stake your claim and then you have to fight off other people. As the Buddha said, objectification is a kind of thinking that leads to conflict. So instead you think in terms of the Four Noble Truths, simply there. What is suffering? What is the cause of suffering? What is the cessation of suffering? What is the path to the cessation? In other words, you think in terms that have nothing to do with becoming, and that cut through the processes of becoming. 
then you find that there's no conflict, and you can delight in that. So as you take these different kinds of delight, they give you the energy you need in order to practice. You're doing a good thing. You've got a good road map. You're following it. You see that it has a good impact on you and the people around you. These six kinds of delight can also counteract the ones that really are unskillful. Delight in the Dharma counteracts the delight that some people take in the idea that there's nothing really explained in the world. It's all a big mystery. There's no true right or wrong. It's all a matter of different people's opinions, some people trying to force their ideas of right and wrong on other people. Which, of course, if you take that attitude, it gives you a wide range of your defilements. You know, after all, good and bad are simply social constructs. You're free to say no to that social construct. Nobody can say that you're wrong, because if they say that you're wrong, it's just a social construct, too. If you leave the processes of birth and death as a mystery, then you don't really know what to do. And when you don't really know what to do, your defilements can move in. So delight in the Dharma helps to counteract those attitudes, some of which have become part of modern Buddhism, sad to say. But if you really delight in the Dharma, it gives you a reason to put them aside. Similarly with delighting in abandoning and delighting in developing. The mind that doesn't delight in developing skillful qualities, doesn't delight in abandoning unskillful ones, that's a mind that's heedless. And there's part of the mind that likes being heedless, the part that likes to say, I don't care what happens down the line. I want what I want right now. I don't want to have to think about things like that. And it's a mind with no sense of shame, no sense of compunction. And again, it's a mind that leads you unguarded, unprotected. Easy prey for your defilements. So when you delight in developing skillful qualities, it fights against those careless, heedless attitudes. When you delight in abandoning unskillful ones, you're basically saying, I've been a friend to craving for a long, a long, long time. I've taken craving as my friend. But now I realize that a lot of unskillful craving is not a true friend. I've been more selective in who I choose as my friends, take as my examples. When you delight in seclusion, that counteracts that, of course, you delight in getting entangled with other people. When you get entangled with other people, as the Buddha said, it's hard for you to find time to settle down with the establishings of mindfulness to get a proper object for the mind, to find the happiness, the well-being that can come when the mind gets concentrated. To learn how to delight in seclusion, even when you haven't developed deep concentration, the fact that you learn how to like being alone will incline the mind in the right direction, opens the possibilities that get closed off when you're constantly dealing with other people, entangled with other people. To delight in non-affliction helps overcome that part of the mind that likes to exert power over other people, the one that doesn't care how much other people suffer, as long as you can get them to do what you want. And to delight in non-objectification helps to counteract that side of the mind that delights in conflict, that likes taking a stance, laying claim to things, fighting other people off. So given that the mind does have these unskillful types of delight, you've got to fight it with skillful delight. You can't just tell yourself, well, the Buddha teaches us to be equanimous about all things. So try to clone that equanimous attitude 
it doesn't have much strength. The desire to stick with the path needs to be nourished. You need to learn how to talk to yourself about what a good path this is. Ultimately, it'll take you to a state that doesn't require all that talking and elaboration, all that embroidery. That's what's so good about Nibbana. It doesn't require a review. It doesn't require a critique. It doesn't require yourself talking about it all the time. It's just there, and you know that it's good, good in and of itself. The Johns talk about this a lot, how it doesn't require a lot of chatter, it doesn't require a lot of praise. It's good in and of itself. It takes you to a point where you don't need to delight in things, and you don't miss the activity of taking delight. It's that good. But just as the end of conceit requires a certain amount of conceit, the end of craving requires a certain amount of craving, so too the end of delight requires that you learn how to take skillful delight. To give you the energy to keep you on the path, and to find a sense of well-being on the path. So you have the strength to follow it all the way through.